He has published extensively in the areas of Dead Sea Scrolls and Jesus and his world. He's participated in archaeological excavations in, in Israel. He's a member of SBL and Society of New Testament Studies. He's an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church. He serves as advisor to the denomination's World Missionary Council. He preaches and lectures globally. We are indeed privileged to have him here tonight. Would you welcome him, James Charlesworth. There was a young teacher, and he said, no one in the world has ever seen what I'm about to see. None of you have ever seen it. And he popped out of his pocket a peanut, broke the husk, showed it to the congregation, and put it in his mouth. Today, I'm going to show you near the end what no Qumran scholar, what no Dead Sea Scroll scholar knows about so I'll be able to show you something that the specialists on the Dead Sea Scrolls have never seen. Would you be interested in seeing that? Yes. Uh, I think it's very important. You and I follow Jesus. And it's not an idea. It's a real person. He lived at a particular time and a particular place. And he did things that were particular for our salvation. That is my paradigm of particularity. Now what we're going to do is enter into that world and ask some questions about where did his followers, where did his Jewish colleagues, where did people find God's word? I've organized this into four questions. First. Did Jesus know a closed canon? Or was he influenced by many of the works that we have just found? And many of them are not in our canon. Many of them are among the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's our first question. Is it a good one? Our second question is, what documents assigned to the New Testament Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha that is, gospels and apocalypses and letters and epistles that circulated for hundreds of years beginning sometime after Jesus. Are there any of those that should be added as an appendix to our Christian canon? Is that a good question? The third question I want to share with you is what sacred documents define New Testament theology? And is that tantamount to a canon? Fourth, did any of those composing works in the canon or compositions eventually not included in our canon imagine they were creating sacred books full of God's word? I won't ask you if you think that's a good one. We all know it is. Was Jesus influenced by works in our canon? I'm son, not in our canon. Especially many writings among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now you know the New Testament is a selection of Jesus' life. All of you can quote the end of John and many other things Jesus said and did, but I'm not going to tell you about them. Well, maybe we will get a glimpse of some of those except for one exception. And we will see it. Jesus quoted authoritatively only from books in our canon. I'll say it again. When you read all of the sayings of Jesus, and when he quotes God's word, when he quotes scripture, Every one of them, with one exception, is in our canon. It is certain that Jesus' knowledge and his theology was shaped not only by the canon, which was not closed, but also by the Jewish thought and writings that were circulating and being composed during his time. 
Before we turn to these texts, we should recognize there's a new perspective sweeping our globe. If we wish to know the mind of Jesus and his followers, we must read what has been discovered recently and not known to the reformers or subsequent theologians. The compositions are not recent. They are recently found. We may now only summarize how these ancient sacra scriptura, sacred scriptures, are important for understanding Jesus. Just a little glimpse. Uh, Jesus was itinerant. He moved around. He didn't sit in a synagogue. He's obviously being thrown out of synagogues. He's out there moving around. And as he moved around, he discussed it with a tremendous passion with many types of Jews, especially the Baptist groups. <laughs> Up and down the Jordan Rift Valley, we know about many groups. Jesus led a Baptist group. John, his cousin, led a Baptist movement. And there are many others. He also talked with many types of Pharisees, many types of Samaritans, the Enoch-oriented Jews, and various types of Essenes, as we know from so many writings today. He's moving around, and he's learning. But of course, you and I know there are other ways he's learning too, but that's not what we're doing now. There is abundant evidence to show that Jesus imagined he was a prophet. His main teaching is to announce the emphasis and the explosion of God's kingdom into the present. Thy kingdom come on earth. If you know anything about Jesus, hold on to that. And then you'll understand the commandments. Do unto others as I have done unto you. Jesus had great dreams, and the dreams are what have shaped the founding of America and its founding the resurgence of our culture today. His dream came from apocalyptic eschatology. Now that dream is in Nuche, in Isaiah 1 through 66, and in Daniel. But we now have so many apocalypses. The apocalypse of Enoch, the apocalypse of Elijah, Elijah, the apocalypse of Abraham, so forth and so on. We can name over 12 apocalypses, and I must say, none of you would have passed an exam on any of them. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is urge you to read two of them. The first one is the fourth book of Ezra. It reached its recognized form sometime after the burning of the temple. When I read it, I think the author has the smoke from the burning of the temple in his nostrils. It's the great book on theodicy ever written. Oh, Adam, what have you done? Because the fall was not yours alone but each of us who are born from you. Very powerful. Oh, Adam, what have you done? Oh, Adam, what have you done? And now you heard the concept of a fall is not a Christian creation. It is there in a Jewish apocalypse. As this was passed on, the Jewish author was translated into Latin and Syriac. He frequently refers to Filius Meus, my son. Filius Meus, my son. God refers to the coming of Filius Meus. As it was passed on from century to century, Christians added Filius Meus Jesus, my son Jesus. And also Filius Meus Christus, Every one of you passes with an A-plus 
Latin exams. You didn't know your Latin was so good. Filius meus Christus, my son Christ. Now you know this was passed on by Christians, so they think it's a Christian book. And in its present form, it's a very deep Christian book. It's extremely important when this author talks about the future. What is the future? Has Eden been opened again? Can we get back into Eden? Now the second apocalypse is even more important. It's the parables of Enoch. Sometimes I refer to it as written by an Einstein of antiquity. Einstein lived a block away from where my office is, so maybe that's kind of a personal connection. But this was a Jew. Einstein was a Jew. This man was a real genius. And uh, certainly if there's a genius that in our mind we'd think it'd be Einstein. Now I'm going to tell you that Jesus was influenced by this writing. Most leading scholars that read it and know it and are also gifted in studying Jesus and doing Jesus research, which is a term I gave to the academy, let's do some Jesus research. I don't like the idea of the quest of the historical Jesus. We never lost him. Now Jesus was influenced by the parables of Enoch. First of all, it was being composed just before Jesus or during his ministry. Okay, same time. It's the same time of Judaism that Jesus espouses. Theocentric, there's only one God. Apocalyptic, the present is full of new revelations. Eschatological, this time is very important. Now, how do I know that? Well, Jesus moved around. He's meeting with these men. I'm not arguing that he read the book. I know he knows the book. You say, oh, come on, tell us the facts. Okay, we've worked through the Old, Old Testament. God is the judge. I can quote over and over again, you can too. When I come as judge, I will condemn the wicked because I am the Lord, your God. You know it. Now, if you read through the Dead Sea Scrolls, God is the judge and he will come to judge us. If you read through all of the Apocrypha, it's the same thing. Same thing in Philo, same thing in Josephus. In summary, everywhere God is judge. You say, well, that's kind of nice. I knew it. Good. Because Jesus says, the Son of Man will come to judge. You say, I remember that. I remember that. The only writing that makes that shift is the parables of Enoch. Let me read from the third parable in the parables of Enoch. Now, you'll say, gosh, I hear the gospel. Okay, don't, don't get too carried away yet. Yeah, still time. And the Son of Man sat on the throne of his glory. And the whole judgment was given to the Son of Man. And he will make sinners vanish and perish from the face of the earth. And those who led the world astray will be bound in chains. And in the assembly place of the destruction they will be confined. The Son of Man. All judgment is given to him. This was written during the... We don't know if it's just before Jesus was born or when he was 10 years old or when he began his ministry. It doesn't matter. It's what's in the air. If there was CNN or Fox News, whew, you know, take the one you want and throw the other one away. <laughs> if there was a cable network, ladies and gentlemen, we've got some breaking news, breaking news. Now after the uh, advertisement, uh, this interval, we'll pick up the good news. And what is the good news? We have met a man, Jesus, and he's been talking with Essenes, and he says, I couldn't believe it. They're right. There is a person called the Son of Man, and he is the one that God wants to judge. And then you have the text I just read. And the Son of Man sat on the throne of his glory, 
and the whole judgment was given to the Son of Man. Now, as I said, Jesus may not have read the work. If you think he did, that's fine too. But he certainly could have discussed it with those who were composing the parables of Enoch. Now, I don't have to quote the New Testament. You have, you have Matthew pretty much memorized when the Son of Man comes in judgment and, and the judgment was given to the Son of Man. You understand that point. And as a historian, I have to ask, where did Jesus get this idea? Now, you have two options. One is God took him and said, Son, yes, Father. Well, that's the way they talked. I want you to learn that I've given judgment to the Son of Man. Well, Father, that's a wonderful idea. But who is the Son of Man? Aha! That's another story, isn't it? Now I want to turn to the Dead Sea Scrolls. People have been working on Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially since they were discovered and hit the pages of all our newspapers and our radios before there were TVs. Today we can report that most scholars have acknowledged that mutatis mutandis, Jesus was influenced by the Essenes. I'm going to give you two examples. And let me tell you the criteria. We're not going to expect Jesus to read a scroll. We're going to expect it to be something that's public that you don't have to read a scroll, but it's a kind of rule or legislation or a kind of a folklore or a kind of practice that people would observe. And people would say, he must be an Essene. The second thing is, the saying must clearly go back to Jesus. And the third thing, it must be absolutely unique to the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's why if we can find anything that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but is also in the Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, in the Old Testament, in, in the Septuagint, in Philo and Josephus, we can't discuss it. We have to find, you see, it's a lot of work, isn't it? My first example is, Jesus said, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Matthew 10, 29 to 31. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Boy, I tell you, if we were in class with Jesus, we would raise our hand and say, who counts them and why would he count them? Now, for the first time, I can explain it to you. Either Jesus is having a very bad day or a scribe had no idea what he was doing or we need to find a context for this text so it becomes rich with meaning. The hairs of your head are numbered. Now, that's a passive. In the New Testament, when you have a passive and no clear actor, it is always God. The hairs of your head have been numbered by God. Now, you say, well, I know that. I have that all memorized. No, no sparrow falls. Good for you. You remember the passage. No sparrow falls without your father's concern. And your father has even counted every hair of your head. Okay, we know what it means now. Why would Jesus say, God has already counted the hairs of your head? Well, digging and exploring. I find in the Damascus document, in a fragment found in cave four, a statement that seems really exciting. Now the priest shall order, and they will shave the head of the sick man, but the bad part, they shall not shave, so that the priest may count the hair and see what is wrong with the person. Jesus is the first reformer. This text makes good sense. Now, how would he see it? Well, if you were walking through the hills of Galilee and you saw a young man or a man with a shaved head, you would say, what's that all about? I've never seen that before because men do not shave their heads. You say, well, haven't you seen what Michael Jordan... 
we're, we're not in the modern era. To shave your head, that's not what men do. So it would be very obvious. Why did you shave your head? So that I can go to the priest and he will tell me what's wrong with my, my scalp. Good. And Jesus says, don't go to the priest. God has already counted your hair. Now, I went to the library and I checked every single commentary. Matthew 10, nothing in German, nothing in French, nothing in Italian. All they tell us about sparrows. Now a sparrow is a little bird. And sometimes a little bird falls down from a tree. And when we look below the tree, we found a dead bird with his feet in the air. <laughs> and I say, well, that is just wonderful, yeah. Told us what we knew as an eight-year-old. No one says, and their very hairs of your head are numbered. We know now it means God has numbered your hair. You don't have to go to a priest. That's why I say Jesus is the first reformer. You are free to go directly to God. And if you need any more proof of that, his name for God is Father. Now, he could have said, you know, I call God Father, but you call him Elohim. He didn't. He said, when you pray, say, Pater. Pater. Now, that's evocative in Luke, and that's the original. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. So the beautiful thing about Jesus, his unique relationship to God, he gives to you in a prayer. And that is a model for prayer, and all of us make a mistake. It's a model for prayer. I turn now to another Dead Sea Scroll that I know Jesus was influenced by. One day, uh, Jesus asked, that's again Matthew 12, 11, he asked a very perplexing question. Uh, what one of you, those among us, well, if he has one animal, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, will not lay hold of it and, and help it out? Well, that's pretty stupid. I have never met anybody that said, you know, one of my cattle fell into the uh, ditch over here and I just didn't do any work to help that animal. The rule is always that life, saving life, is superior to any rule whatsoever. So there wouldn't be anybody that I can think of. No Jew that ever lived would say, just leave it in the ditch. So again, we have a problem. Jesus was drinking, drinking too much wine. Jesus had a migraine. Jesus doesn't make sense and just leave it alone. That was what we were taught early on in the 16th century, but not all of us were alive then. If you have a problem in the text, just leave it alone. Oh, no, that's what we want to do. We want to take seriously every passage of the New Testament. And Jesus, we are going to examine your mind because we're going to follow you whatever you think, but I'd like you to think something that's thinkable and make wise. So Jesus says, hey, is there anybody in this room? You can stand up and scream, I would. <laughs> now, I've never allowed people to do that, but uh, let's assume I didn't ask you to do that because we may have some people here that need a little more help than I can give them. <laughs> imagine, imagine, you know, that in some place, Anywhere, there is a person that says, I think the Sabbath is very important. We must not do any work. And if an animal falls into the pit, too bad. No, I've never met anybody. So Jesus, what are you talking about? What are you imagining? Now we have to find a text. The text has to talk about the Sabbath. The text has to say if an animal falls into a pit. So we have to have Sabbath, animal, and pit. And it says you must leave him there because you mustn't do anything that's a work. Now, you can get the mind, we mustn't do anything to violate the Sabbath. Guess what I found in cave four? No, actually, this is uh, 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 an earlier, uh, a fuller text. Listen to me, please. Let no one deliver the young of an animal on Shabbat on the Sabbath day 
And if it falls into a pit or a ditch, let him not raise it on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. The teaching is unique to the G Essenes. According to Josephus, they're in every city. Now, maybe you haven't lived in Jerusalem and, and realized that beginning at 3 o'clock on Friday, people are running home. Then you don't hear a car. You don't drive. You don't hear a radio. It must be quiet. Which means in Jesus' time, on the Sabbath, Far away, you could hear an animal call for its life. And I can, it's public. He doesn't have to read a text. And Jesus would say, well, what's that all about? And you could then imagine uh, the Sabbath. Uh, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. Jesus is taught by God. He is our Savior. And by these insights, we begin to realize he was like us in every way as a human being. He became like us. Now, I don't have time to do it, but there are many, many passages. Those are the negatives. A lot of people conclude looking at a partial vat, a data, Jesus cannot be an Essene. Other people say, I'll look at other things, and Jesus was an Essene. The Essenes created the concept of the sons of light. Jesus refers to it many times in the New Testament. The best one is John 12. Walk in the light while you have the light that you don't walk in darkness so that you can become sons of light. You all said it with me. Good for you. Walk in the light so that you can become now, if the Essenes created that, Jesus takes it and finds it to be very important. Who wouldn't want to say, wow, that's a great idea. I want to walk in the light. And then it goes on, so I do not perish, but have everlasting light. Throughout the Old Testament, or Hebrew Aramaic scriptures, we hear about the Holy Spirit of God, God's Holy Spirit. Beginning with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we hear about the Holy Spirit. There's a big difference between God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit from God. The Holy Spirit from God. Now, we know the Essenes developed that because when they left Jerusalem, they felt that the Spirit had gone with them. And when they got to the ruins of a fort from about the time of Isaiah, Jeremiah. They knew they were the holy ones, Kiddoshim. Some were Kiddoshe Kiddoshim, the holy of holy ones. And why is that? Because they lived in the Baith Kodesh, the house of holiness. And why are they the holy ones living in the house of holiness? Because the Holy Spirit had left the temple and was in their midst. Now, there are many others that we can talk about. Jesus, in Matthew, blesses those who are celibate for the kingdom of heaven. The only celibate group we know are the Essenes living at Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and will continue to be found. Now, the Christian canon. We've talked about Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. What documents in the Apocryphal New Testament should be in an appendix of the Christian canon? First of all, let me say, no way are we going to add these books. The Gospel of Peter, a lot of people want it added. No. It is not so early as people demand. It is second century. And it should not be in our canon because it is full of fables and fairy tales. No one in the New Testament tells you how the resurrection occurs. But if you listen to this author, the angels come down and they move the stone. Jesus walks out and he scratches his head on the, on the heavens and the cross comes walking after him. You know we've left history and gone into mythology. No way. 
The Acts of John. Oh, no way should it be added. John is sitting up on the Mount of Olives, and many of us have been there. And he was looking down at Jesus being crucified, and, and great tears came in from his eyes. And he, he says, oh, this is terrible. And the man walks up and puts his hand on his shoulder, and he says, John, don't be upset. What is occurring down there is an illusion. And he says, oh, Jesus, I don't want that in my Bible. Jesus died on that cross and he died if you'll forgive me I'm a Methodist minister and I'm surrounded by angels Baptists <laughs> I feel at home there's a meaning in his death we may never be able to explain it that's not what we're supposed to do we can experience it. We can feel it. And most of all, we can say, thank you, thank you. The Gospel of Judas. I don't want to spend much time on that. Uh, when the New York Times called me and said we're doing a special on the uh, uh, Gospel of Ju uh, Judas, I said, well, first of all, let me make a point. Judas had nothing to do with it. It was hundreds of years later. Judas did not write it. And I heard him scream to the typist, stop, kill the story. That's why it never appeared in the New York. It's no way. Now let me tell you some writings that will help you grow. Come closer to God and feel the power of Jesus' message. The first one is the Odes of Solomon. We don't know whether it's Jewish or originally Christian. I have tried to show for 40 years, and I've been pretty successful, that it was written by a Jew that became then a follower of Jesus, considered him the Messiah, and lived in the Gospel of John's community and influenced the final writing of the Gospel of John. We will look at that. It's very much like the Joannine epistles. The Lord is on my head like a crown. The Coptic, the choice, echen ta'ape and tehe enuklom. The Lord is on my head like a crown, but it's a wreath. Is he thinking about the crown of thorns? He's a poet. And I shall never be outside him. I will never be away from him. He is the Lord. The Lord Jesus is on my head like a crown. I want that in my Bible it's as an appendix. The Gospel of Thomas, yes, that has to be added in the appendix because many of the parables are preserved there that we don't know about and some of them have a good chance of going back in a pre-edited form to Jesus. If we're interested in the parables of Jesus, we have to look at the Gospel of Thomas. The dating of that is very notorious. I would say sometime after 110, maybe after 130, but not too late because the writing down of tradition doesn't date a tradition. The infancy gospel of James. Ah, oh, this is a beautiful one. Professor Zervos is working on a two-volume monograph for my series, and he has convinced many scholars that the reference to the temple is so positive and that when Mary, she's a dancing girl in the temple, we didn't think that was possible. And now the top Jewish scholars working on the remains of the temple and working on traditions about the temple say, this makes sense. This seems to be from the time when girls danced in the temple. You say, dancing, you go to hell. Read about David dancing. Did you ever dance for joy? That's what we're talking about. Uh, uh, there's a good dancing, dancing, celebrating. Uh, David danced in the temple. Young girls danced in the temple. So I would want that one in. Uh, Edgerton too. that's a good candidate. Uh, it is very early. Uh, in many ways, it's earlier than what we have as witnesses to Mark and John and Matthew and Luke. Um, here's a passage that I'd like you to have as an appendix. Search the scriptures in which you think you have life. It is they which bear witness to me. 
Well, I'd like to have that in my appendix. Now, as we've been trying to show you for several days now, it's a reference to scriptures. What's the list? What's in? What's out? We don't know. Oxyrhynchus 840. I am clean, for I have bathed in the pool of David and have gone down by one staircase and come up by the other, and I have put on clean white clothes. This is a saying of Jesus. Jesus would never have been able to go into the temple until he went into a mikvah. And the mikvah oat we have excavated in the last few years have a step down, a divider, and a step back. And that's exactly what this man says. I've gone down on one side and up on the other. Let's have it there. Maybe it goes back to Jesus. Jesus said, I am clean. For I have bathed in the pool of David and have gone down by one staircase and come up by the other. I think the gospel of truth may perhaps be added. I'm very moved by the statement, the gospel of truth is a joy to those who know it. I want Christians to be joyful. I want people to pour in the church because that's where you found real joy. I want us not to go around saying, I'm a sinner, I'm no good. I should be sent to hell. I want us to say, I feel marvelous. Wouldn't you like to feel like that? I'm getting a joy, a joy. And everybody in this room knows the joy of experiencing Jesus, the joy of not being condemned. In fact, that may be the greatest strength of Christian theology. You are no longer condemned by yourself. And each of us kick ourselves all the time. Charlesworth, what's wrong with you? Well, I don't have time to list all that, you know. Now, what sacred documents define New Testament theology? And that is tantamount to a canon. What I want to do is turn to one little passage. It's the epistle of Jude. Listen to me as I read verses 14 and 15. You say, what chapter? Aha, you don't know it. It's only one chapter. <laughs> the author of Jude 14 and 15. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all they are ungodly among them of all, their un of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against. It is an attribution to a document. You know that. And Enoch also, the second from Adam, prophesied. The author of Jude says he has a document that was connected with Enoch, maybe written by Enoch, and it's a prophetusen, aorist, prophecy. You can hear it in the Greek, a prophetusen. You can hear the prophecy. Wouldn't it be nice if we had that document? Maybe we should keep looking. We found it. We found it in an Aramaic fragment from the time of Herod the Great. And it's exactly this portion. So we know that Jude has in his canon a document that you heard about maybe for the first time. The books of Enoch. Now, I want to turn to the Odes of Solomon. Did any of those composing works in the non-canonical, to use that term, imagine they were creating or preserving God's words? Except for Paul's letters and some other epistles, the New Testament authors intermittently give you the idea that they are writing Scripture. Certainly John thought he was. He who has heard me has heard the Father. What I say, I don't say of my own authority. What I hear the Father speak, I say to you, that is sacred scripture. The author who wrote that knew that for his community and the earliest followers of Jesus, Jesus was the canon. 
Now my friend Lee McDonald will develop that a little more, and I enjoyed conversations with him. As Professor Vermish of Oxford said, Jesus as a miracle, miracle worker was the axis mundi. It's where fire of heaven touched the earth, and the power went out, and he healed, and he did wonderful deeds. Also in terms of the canon, who, not what is the canon, Jesus is the canon. What Jesus thinks, what Jesus says, that is what God wants us to know. Now, I want to turn now to the oldest. It's the earliest Christian hymn book. Listen to this. I want this to be in your appendix. Rise up and stand erect. You who once were brought low. You who have been in silence, speak, for your mouth has been opened. You who were despised from henceforth be lifted up, for your righteousness, cap R, has been lifted up. A paranomasia about being lifted up on the cross. You who have been downcast, be lifted up, because your righteousness has been lifted up. Only in John does upsotheo mean be lifted up on the cross. Now, I can't read all of this. Uh, I'm not even going to read the summary. I want to get back to our youth. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Oh, we sang it so well, didn't we? Yes, that's the book for me. As wonderful as those early days were, we tended to make the Bible an object of focus. We tended to worship the Bible and carry it with us to church. It became too much like an idol. Now, you know in the Bible it says, you shall not, second commandment, you shall not make any graven image in the heavens above and the water, in the earth beneath or the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down and serve them. Far too often, you and I are guilty of making the Bible an idol. What's wrong with that? Well, don't forget that Samuel Taylor Coleridge said so brilliantly, bibliolatry, the worship of the Bible, bibliolatry is a form of idolatry. The Bible doesn't want us to worship it. It is that magnificent window from here to where we long to go. Now, I'm going to try to share with you some conclusions. We have not found any passages where Jesus clearly quoted, quoted authoritatively from anything that's not in our canon. That's our first. That's a big discovery. Second, compositions co composed by or edited by the early Christians should be read carefully and meditatively as we seek to draw closer to Jesus who descended from the hills of Nazareth and to the hearts and minds of so many here today. Third, we can talk about New Testament theology. The books canonized were very influential and quoted in them. But not, let us forget Jude quotes from the books of Enoch, and we have an Aramaic fragment from that exact passage. Fourth, there are documents that didn't make it into the canon that record God's will and God's word. As we know, the author of John knew about many things that Jesus said, but he did not tell us them. Let's remember Strickland Gillilin. I think God kept on talking when his book had gone to press, that God continues speaking to the listening souls of us. I think God's voice is busy yet to teach and guide and bless that every time we ask for light, 
God calls to us again. Now, the canon is a rule. Kane in Hebrew means rule. You go out into the wilderness, you cut a reed length, and you now have a kane, a rule, uh, and now you can get the kind of uh, garment you want, the silk you want. And the Bible is a rule given to you so that you know when you f look at the sunset or the sunrise or hear Mozart, you can say, applying the rule that I've learned from our closed canon, no one should ever open it. It's there. It's been there for a long while. And it's not our task. Any of us, doesn't matter where we are teaching, we need to realize it's a measuring stick so we can see God's love in the eyes of others. So you become part of the canon. We see it, God's word, in many books written by people you love, your pastors, and in the sermons we often hear but most importantly, in the souls of those we love or maybe those we met for the first time. The canon opens to us wonders around us that help us understand the inscribed words so that every time we ask for light, God calls to us again. Thank you.